This morning we're going to talk about relationship with God, relationship with Jesus. Uh, what kind of relationship should you have with the Lord? Should it be formal and dignified? Should it be very familiar? Uh, what kind of relationship does Jesus want to have with you? What was Jesus like around people, especially in big gatherings of people? Uh, was he standoffish? Was he warm? Was he severe, austere? What was he like? This is what I think. I think that Jesus wants to have a warm, personal, intimate relationship with each one of us. Actually, he wants to have a one flesh type of relationship with each of us. And I think that he's always calling us deeper into a relationship with him. And I want to show you through scripture this morning what Jesus is like. I want to show you his heart and I want to show you how he loves and he wants to be closer to you than any human could ever be. But unfortunately, many Christians just don't know this. They think that Jesus is like their earthly father. I've had several friends describe their relationship with their earthly father, and they say things like this. They say, well, he never said he loved me. He never hugged me. He never showed any kind of outward emotion toward me. Oh, he provided for me. He protected me, but there was never any show of emotion. And so naturally, most of them grow up thinking, well, this must be the way my heavenly father is. But that just couldn't be farther from the truth. When, when you enter your prayer closet, Jesus is waiting there for you with his arms wide open. And when you walk into your prayer closet, he has a big smile on his face and he wraps his arm around you with a big bear hug. And he says, oh, I'm so glad you're here. I love you so much. What are we going to talk about today? Now, let me add some balance to this before we go on any further, okay? Jesus and the Holy Spirit, they're not your buddies. They are absolutely the most powerful beings in the whole universe. They deserve all praise. They deserve all honor. They deserve all reverence. Some might even say fear. They deserve all respect. But all that grandeur and power notwithstanding... Jesus and the Holy Spirit want to live in the heart of every human being. That's why they want you to get saved, so they can live inside of you. They long to have a very personal, very intimate, one flesh relationship with each one of us. And I want to prove that today through Scripture. I remember some time ago, I was watching on TV, there was a speech that was being given by one of the Iranian Ayatollahs. And he never looked at the camera. Uh, when Before and after the speech, people were around him. He never looked them in the eye, didn't look anybody in the eye. I later learned that this is a technique that powerful people often use, especially when they want to look powerful and they want to be aloof, is they won't look anybody in the eye. What about, um, what about superstar preachers today? Uh, you've seen this. Uh, they, they preached, and then they got whisked off right away off the stage, surrounded by their bodyguards. I mean, nobody can talk to them. Nobody can touch them. Uh, sometimes uh, <laughs> it's funny what happens with some church leaders or in other countries because they expect me to be like that, okay? And I tell them, okay, after I preach then I'm going to um, take some time to pray for people. And no, no, after you preach, we're going to take you to dinner with the elders. I said, no, I want to be able to take some time to pray for folks, uh, maybe even pray for everybody that's there. And they look at me like they just don't understand what I'm saying. What? You don't want to do that. And then they start explaining to me why I don't want to do that. I mean, um, uh, it might take an hour or two. 
these people are, you have to understand, they're common people. They might be dirty. Some of them might be sick. Uh, you might not want to touch some of them. Um, you might get tired praying for all those folks. And you know what? In a couple of instances, I've had to tell the church leaders, look, if I can't pray for people afterwards, if I can't touch them, if that's how the Lord leads, I'm not going to minister here. And in a couple of cases, they were reluctant. They relented, but they were reluctant to do that. So what was Jesus like when he was ministering to people? How, was he the big superstar on a big platform? Let's take a look at, at one situation I think is very telling. It's in Mark 3, Mark 3, verse 20, and we're going to look at verses 20 and 21. Mark 3, 20 and 21. Again, lots of scriptures today. You might want to write these down if you can. <clears throat> um, and he came home. And the crowd gathered again, to, and they gathered to such an extent that they could not even eat a meal. When his own people heard of this, they went up to take custody of him, for they were saying, he's lost his senses. <laughs> Jesus gave himself completely into personal ministry to the extent he didn't even have time to eat. I mean, he was right there in the middle of the crowd. He was being jostled about by people. He wasn't on some big platform far away. Uh, it, this is in his home where he was. And he just let people continue to gather, and he just kept ministering, kept ministering, kept ministering, until his, his family thought, there's something wrong, man. He's not even taking time to eat. we got to do something about this. He was so interested in being with the people. So let's look at some other things. What was Jesus like on this earth? Was he standoffish? Was he like that Ayatollah? Um, was he cold, aloof? Was he warm? Did he invite intimacy? Let's look at some things. Turn to John 13, the Gospel of John chapter 13. And I want to give you a scripture that gives us some insight into how Jesus feels about being close with us. John 13, 23. It says, uh, There was reclining on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. This term whom Jesus loved, we know that that's talking about the disciple John. And you got to remember that in those days, they didn't eat dinner sitting down like we do. They, uh, they laid down on couches. And it says here that while they were laying together, that John was leaning his head against Jesus' chest or against his bosom. Uh, this word bosom is sometimes translated lap. Like in uh, Luke 6.38, where it says, Give, and men, you give to God, and then men shall give into your bosom, into your lap. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together. When Jesus was talking about how Lazarus went, you know, died and went into the bosom of Abraham, he was describing what, how the Jews referred to paradise uh, at the time. And so that's the picture we have here. Uh, it's coming into the chest, into the lap, into something close. And this is one instance in John 13. But look at um, John 21. John 21, and we're going to look at verse 20. Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also leaned back on his bosom at supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? So at the Last Supper... John was again leaning against Jesus' bosom or leaning against his chest while they were eating. I mean, that's a pretty intimate picture of friendship, isn't it? I mean, somebody resting their head on the chest of another person while they eat. I mean, if some guy leaned up against my chest while I was eating, I might say, hey, man, get off. <laughs> You're invading my space, dude. I mean, what's wrong with you? Don't you want to eat? But that's not the way Jesus was. Jesus was very tender and very kind about this act of intimacy. Let's look at some other verses. Luke 7. 
Luke chapter 7, verses 14 and 15. The scene here, we're not going to read all of it, but the scene here is where a, apparently a young man has died. The funeral possession is uh, going through town, which I guess was their custom at the time. And um, we pick up the scene where Jesus meets the funeral possession here in Luke 7, verse 14. And he came up and he touched the coffin and the bearers came to a halt. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. The dead man sat up and began to speak. Now listen to this next part. Did Jesus act like one of those Ayatollahs? Put his nose up in the air. Okay, woman, uh, <laughs> you can have your boy now. I've done my thing. And walk off? No. It said he gave, Jesus gave the boy back to his mother. I think Jesus literally handed the boy, picked him up, carried him over to his mother. Jesus was involved in a very personal act. He wanted to look that woman in the eye and see the joy in her eyes. He wanted to experience that with her. Turn to Luke 24. This is on the road to Emmaus, as we say. Luke 24. We're going to start in um, verse 29. So Jesus and two disciples are walking along. It's been hours walking, it sounds like. And Jesus is telling them, um, is, is um, opening up to them the scriptures. And it gets toward evening. It says here, let's pick up in verse 29. But they urged him saying, stay with us for it's getting toward evening and the day is nearly over. And he went in to stay with them. When he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it, and breaking it, he began giving it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. Now listen to this part. And they said to one another, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? Listen, your heart only burns. When you're in the presence of someone that you love dearly and you know that they love you dearly and you have an intimate relationship with them. And even though they didn't know at first who he was, they still had this burning in their heart, this intimacy between Jesus and them. These emotions that only come from deep love and deep intimacy. Let's look at one more picture of how Jesus was. John 20. John 20, and we'll start with verse 24. I love these scriptures about how Jesus was intimate. John 20 and 24. We're actually going to go through 28, but let's start in 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus. Didymus is, means twin. They, it was his nickname. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called twin, was not with them when Jesus had come to them the first time. So the other disciples were telling him, We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hands in his hands, the imprint of the nails, unless I put my fingers into the place of the nails, unless I put my hand into his side, I'm going to be skeptical about this. I'm going to be intellectual, I guess. Well, after eight days... His disciples were again inside, and twin was with them. And Jesus just, even though the doors were shut, Jesus shows up. He appears in the middle of the room, and he says, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger and see my hands, and reach here with your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Jesus invites Thomas to touch his wounds. Jesus made this personal. He made it intimate. Thomas, come close to me and touch me in my wounded places. Are you getting the picture yet? Jesus was so personal. He was so warm. He was so loving. He was so intimate. Let's take it a step further. I think that Jesus wants us to have a one flesh relationship with him. Turn to Ephesians 5. 
And I'm going to show you this from Scripture. Paul was so certain that we should have an intimate relationship with Jesus that he compared our relationship with Jesus to the one flesh relationship of marriage. And I don't know about your marriage, but my marriage is pretty intimate and it's a one flesh relationship. So Paul starts describing in the second half of chapter five here. He's describing giving lots of good advice for um, for married couples. We're going to pick it up, though, right at the bottom in verse 32 and 33, because I want you to see why Paul is describing marriage. He says, this mystery is great, talking about marriage, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Paul describes human holy matrimony, marriage, as a type or an analog of our relationship with the Lord, the relationship between Jesus and His church. And you look at verse 33, and it starts with the word nevertheless. So it's like Paul is saying, I've said all this about marriage so that you can better understand the relationship of Jesus and the church. But oh, by the way, it's still a good thing for you husbands to love your wives and your wives love your hus- love and respect your husbands. But the point is, <laughs> this is really about Jesus and the church. So if go back to verse 31. Paul there is quoting from Genesis 2, Genesis 2:24. Uh, the relationship of a husband and wife. It says, For this reason a man shall leave his mother and his father, shall be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is the ideal relationship for human marriage. It's also the ideal relationship for our relationship with Jesus. Uh, I know many married couples that have admitted that they have sometimes at some time said something like this. They have said to their spouse in a private, intimate moment, they've said, I love you so much. I wish I could just be inside you. I wish I could crawl inside you and just be so close to you. That's how I feel about you. Well, that's a one flesh relationship. Eventually, we get to a place where we're comfortable with each other. We know we're not doubting whether or not we love each other anymore. Uh, We love our spouse uh, as we love ourselves. We know that. They know that. That's the kind of relationship that Jesus wants to have with us, a one flesh relationship. Now, let's look at some of the verses just before verses 31 through 33. And as I read through these, I want, I want you to be looking for something, okay? Look for two things. One, Paul is describing an ideal one flesh relationship between a husband and a wife. But number two, look for this. Paul is constantly comparing the human one flesh relationship of marriage with the relationship between Jesus and his church. It's almost as if Paul's not sure which one he's talking about. Or better yet, it's almost as if he's saying you can't really understand one relationship unless you understand the other and vice versa. Look back up in verse 22. He says, wives, be subject to your husbands. And he doesn't just stop there. He says, be subject to your husbands as you're subject to the Lord. Can you imagine a wife talking to Jesus? You're talking to him about something he wants you to do. And, and you tell Jesus, well, you know, I appreciate your thoughts on this matter, Lord. But uh, I think I'm going to make an independent decision here and uh, do this on my own. Can you imagine saying that? <laughs> you never do that. Turn to John. At least you wouldn't do it on purpose. Turn to John 5. Let's see what kind of relationship Jesus had with his father. Would he have told his father that? Go to John 5, verse 19. John 5 and 19. Therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. 
For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. Talk about submission. <laughs> oh, man. Jesus is saying, Father, I just want to crawl into your skin and I just never want to say anything or do anything that isn't 100% in harmony with you and where you're going. Can you imagine a more intimate relationship than that? Never say or do anything I don't first hear and see from you. And yet, that's the kind of intimacy that Jesus wants to have with us. Look at verse 25 of Ephesians 5. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. Paul says, Husbands, love your wives. Again, he doesn't stop there. He says, As Jesus also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Wow, that's a tall order. <laughs> this is the Jesus that's not counting our sins against us, right? Uh, husbands, um, do you never take inventory of your wife's sins or failings? Um, imagine, just imagine how much more intimate and fulfilling your relationship with your wife would be if you never ever noticed any of her failings. Paul compares a husband giving himself to his wife as Jesus gave himself for the church. This is like the parable of the chicken and the pig at breakfast time. So, you know, a proper English breakfast has bacon and eggs at least. And when you're having your breakfast, you realize the chicken has contributed to my breakfast. He, that's where the egg came from. But you also realize the pig was totally committed to my breakfast because that's where the bacon came from. <laughs> are you just contributing <laughs> to your marriage? Or are you totally committed like the pig was to your marriage? How easy would it be for your wife to be subject to you, husband, if you loved her and gave yourself for her the way Jesus gave himself for the church. When we have a marriage like Paul is describing here, the level of intimacy is through the roof. But remember, Paul's not really talking about human marriage. He's talking about our intimate relationship with Jesus. He's just using marriage to help us understand and to illustrate that relationship. Paul's calling us into a deep, intimate, marriage-like relationship with Jesus. I know several people, including myself, who have had an experience where, uh, at least for a few seconds, you just feel the power of the love of God, and it's an overwhelming experience. Let me tell you about the time that happened to Debbie. She was driving along, going somewhere. Uh, she wasn't particularly praying or worshiping. She was concerned about something or something that was going on. And she was a little concerned. And just all of a sudden, God let Debbie feel a little of his love for her. And she said it was so powerful. It was so bedroom intimate. She said it was, it was almost painful. And it, as it went on for a few seconds, and it just became stronger and stronger. She finally said, Lord, stop. I'm going to have a wreck if you don't stop. She just couldn't take it anymore. That's the way the Lord feels about us. We just can't always experience it. That's all. You know, maybe some of you have experienced this sort of thing. I hope you have. I hope you will if you haven't. Hope you, if you have, hope you'll experience it again because it's an amazing thing. I'm not saying we need to feel that kind of powerful intimacy all the time. I mean, that's not the way marriage is, right? But it does illustrate straight clearly that God has strong emotions of love for us and He wants to share with us that close, intimate, emotional relationship. Jesus is calling us into intimacy with Him. I have a friend who 
is, I guess you'd call him a Sunday-only Christian. Actually, I've had several friends like this, like this, and um, um, you know what I'm talking about. You've known people like this, and uh, he, they would go to church on Sunday, and they'd be Christian, act like a Christian on Sunday, but during the rest of the week, they kind of did their own thing and acted the way they wanted to. And I remember talking to this one guy about my prayer life, and I was encouraging him to develop a prayer life, and I was describing uh, how I'd maybe put on some praise music and worship the Lord, and uh, then maybe I'd read the Word some, and then I'd move into prayer there in the presence of the Lord, and, and how wonderful that was. And I was trying to help him understand what a what a powerful experience it was and how, how satisfying it was, how good it made me feel to be close to the Lord. And, you know, he'd say, nah, I'm just not like that. That just doesn't sound very interesting to me. And I'm telling you, my heart broke for this guy. And I knew that the Lord was really heart sick over his attitude, too, because because I knew how much Jesus wanted to have a close, intimate relationship with this guy, but he just wouldn't, okay? It reminded me of a scene out of Matthew, Matthew chapter 23, Matthew chapter 23, and we're going to look at verse 37. Jesus is talking to a crowd here, and then he directs his attention to Jerusalem, and he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather you, to gather your children together, the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you are unwilling. Jesus wanted to gather Israel as a hen gathers her chicks around her. And you can just hear the heartbreak in Jesus' words when he says, but you are unwilling. But listen to me. This is the way Jesus feels about you too. Oh, how I want to gather you under my protection. Oh, how I want to bring you close to me so that you can feel my warmth. I can feel your warmth. Do you hear him calling to you today? Don't tell me that you can't be close to Jesus. Don't say things like, well, I'm unworthy. Or, um, well, you just don't know some of the things that I've done. Jesus doesn't want to be close to me. I've heard people say these things. Or, I'm not good enough. I'm not spiritual enough. These are all false excuses. God washes away your sins. He has made you clean. He's made you just as innocent as Jesus is. God literally has made you His righteousness. Look at John 16. John 16, verses 26 through 27. Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says, In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say that I will request it of the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and you have, and you have believed that I have come from the Father. Listen, ask the Father anything you want because He loves you just like He loves me. If there's anything in the way of your intimacy with God, it's either you or the devil. It is not God. Some say that we can't be intimate with God or that we shouldn't be. And they say that describing our relationship with Jesus as intimate somehow cheapens the relationships. Have you ever read the Song of Solomon, I want to say to these folks? You talk about an intimate picture of the relationship between Jesus and the church. I mean, some part of that is just almost R-rated. How can you say God wants us to have some kind of a formal, arm's length relationship with Him? That's just not true. So I want to go through some scriptures now. Um, showing the kind of compassion that Jesus has, okay? Because I think Jesus has a real tender heart, and I want to show that to you. So let's start with uh, Matthew 9 and 36. We're going to read several scriptures real quickly in a row here. Matthew 9 and verse 36. 
Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them, for they were distressed and dispirited, like sheep without a shepherd. Now go on to Matthew 14. Matthew 14, 14. Matthew 14, 14. When he went ashore, he saw a large, cra- large crowd, and he felt compassion for them, and he healed their sick. Mark 15. Mark 15 and 32. And Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I feel compassion for the people because they have remained with me now three days and have had nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry, for they might faint on the way. As a parent, how many times has your kid come to you and said, I'm hungry, and you said, go get, go get a snack, or don't bother me. Or Jesus felt compassion for these people when they were hungry. Matthew 20, Matthew 20, verse 34. Moved with compassion, Jesus touched their eyes, these eyes of two blind men, and immediately they regained their sight and they followed him. Mark chapter 1, Mark chapter 1, verse 41, Mark 1, 41. Moved with compassion, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, he said to the leper, I am willing, be cleansed. The book of Luke, chapter, this is not all the places. This is just the highlight, okay? Luke 7, 13. Luke 7, 13. When the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her, and he said to her, don't weep. It's not uncommon when I am ministering to people, praying for the sick, praying for inner healing, deliverance, whatever we're praying for. Often the Holy Spirit allows me to feel some of the emotion that He's feeling toward the person that I'm ministering to. It's a great compassion. Sometimes it's almost overwhelming. Sometimes I can hardly stand while I'm feeling this. Sometimes I start to cry. Sometimes I just want to reach over and give them a big bear hug and just hold on to them and never let them go. That's how I feel. The Lord is letting me feel some of the compassion that He's feeling for those people. And as a matter of fact, if you see someone, especially you see a stranger, and all of a sudden this gift of compassion begins to well up within you, you can know that that's probably coming from the Lord. He probably wants you to minister to them. And if you're not in a place where you can minister to them, then He wants you to at least do some intercessory prayer on their behalf. They need a touch from Him, and He wants you to be part of that. And you'll know because of the compassion. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's just let's wrap up here, okay? Um... And I want to wrap up with one more scripture. 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 16. 1 Corinthians 3, 16. I want to conclude with this thought. Do you know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? So, who lives in a temple to a god? If you're a pagan in ancient Greek and you went to the temple of Diana, who would you expect to find in the temple of Diana? Well, you'd expect your goddess Diana to be there, right? Okay, who lives in God's holy temple? We are the holy temple of God. It's God Almighty, our Heavenly Father, that lives there. The fact that God lives there makes it holy. So what or who is the temple of God? It's every Christian in this world. It's you. You're the holy temple 
of God, and He wants to live inside you. Don't tell me that you can't have a close personal relationship with your Heavenly Father. Don't tell me that you're not pure enough, you're not good enough, you're not spiritual enough. When you ask Jesus to come live in your heart, you accepted Him as your Savior, He makes you holy. He makes you His holy temple. He makes you holy so He can live there. And He wants to enjoy living in His holy temple. And He wants you to enjoy the intimate relationship that you can have with Him while He makes Himself at home inside you, His holy temple. Let me encourage you to go deeper and deeper into your intimate relationship with Jesus. Let Him wrap His arms around you. Let Him smile at you and tell you how much He really, really loves you. Amen.